Well, thank you very much, um, both to the U UEA and to, to Professor Bowen in particular for asking me to do this lecture. It's great to have an opportunity to talk about my research, and as people who know me well know, I can talk and talk and talk about it. Um, I will try my best to keep this down to a reasonable length. So this is me, though after a month in lockdown, I'm a little bit more dishevelled and I've had a slightly more interesting haircut. Um, I'm an associate professor at the UEA Law School and I have a slightly unusual background. And I, I started as a mathematician, I've been an accountant, a human rights activist, a highly unsuccessful on, entrepreneur in the early days of the internet, and the finance director of a mental health charity before returning to academia. And they gave me the opportunity to do something that I really wanted to do, despite my not really fitting into any obvious academic box. Now I teach internet law, media law, privacy law, and a few other things to both law students and students of other subjects such as politics and broadcast journalism. One of my other projects, which will be launched next week, is research funded by the Joseph Rowntree um, Reform Trust into the implications of automatic voter registration um, for the UK, led by UAE's Professor of Politics, Toby James. Most of what I do, however, centres around the internet, which is why, though I would very much like to have done this, this lecture in person, it's somewhat appropriate that I should be the first person to give one of these lectures online. My research in particular is almost all about the internet. I started as a privacy specialist, but perhaps the most important part of what I do is see how everything is connected together. The internet isn't just a physical network, but a metaphorical one. As a privacy specialist, I soon found myself talking more and more about freedom of speech. And as someone working accidentally in the field of law, I found myself talking more and more about regulation. My first book, based on my PhD thesis, was called Internet Privacy Rights. The focus clearly on privacy. The second, published in 2018, was The Internet Warts and All, Free Speech, Privacy and Truth. And that, uh, the fact that I put free speech before privacy in the um, subtitle gives you a clue to quite, quite how my research has seemed to shift. The thing is that when you research one area, you soon find that it, it, that it impacts upon another. And that's part of the problem that we have with regulation from the start. Privacy is still the key to what I do because privacy underpins all the other rights. And as we'll see, the, our failure to regulate in favour of privacy is one of the main reasons that regulation of the internet fails in the way that it does. Both of those two books are relatively serious, weighty and expensive academic tomes. My most recent book, published just a month ago, is the beautiful little fetching, fetching pink book, What Do We Know and What Should We Do About Internet Privacy? This is a much more accessible, cheaper and prettier book than, than the others. Um, and it's designed to help people to understand these issues in a much more um, broad brush kind of way, but to make the connections, because the connections are really the most important part of all of this. If I were giving this lecture in person, I'd have some nice copies of this to give you. As it is, we're going to give you a link so that you can, you can um, connect to it either to, to order it or to download a, a Kindle version. Point of, about all of the books, the thing they have in common is that they're about how things link together. The way that we need to see the bigger picture is a key to the whole approach and trying to find new ways of thinking about this. And in order to do so, we need to change our attitude, not just to the Internet itself, but to privacy and to regulation. When I first started working in this field, the Internet was still a bit of a niche subject. Internet privacy, even more so, let alone Internet law. Many people didn't even think Internet law really existed. They still imagined the Internet to be a kind of wild west, which is something I'm going to refer to, return to later on in the, in the talk. It's one of the most damaging ideas, false ideas about the Internet that, that, that goes around and gets repeated again and again. Um, most companies, many companies, didn't even have websites when I started working. It was seen as a rather strange thing, and vast numbers of people didn't even know what email was, let alone use it. Now, all of that is far from true. There are very few aspects of our lives that don't have a significant online element. And as we've seen for, through this coronavirus, we can do many of the things that we normally do online, and we have to do many of the things that we used to do online. 
we communicate online, we find our information online, we work online, often in jobs that we found online, we socialize online, we get our entertainment online, we even find romance online, we get our news online, and now we're educated online. Geeks like me may have been using video conferencing for, for decades, but now everybody does. Who had even heard of Zoom a few weeks ago? Now it's one of the most popular and well-used pieces of, um, of tech around. One of the many implications of the ways that our lives have moved online is that it's meant that governments have found themselves in a position where they need to take the internet seriously. And in many areas, that means they want to regulate it. They want to control it. And the problem is that in general, they still don't really understand it. What they do understand is currently they can't and don't control it. They worry about people using it in bad ways, in out of control ways. There are these regular, almost wholly inappropriate references to the internet being a wild west that needs somehow to be tamed. That unfortunate me uh, metaphor is not true in a practical sense, nor in a legal sense. Most of the time, the internet isn't particularly wild. It's something that we use every day. There is an enormous amount of law that already functions online. From things like data protection law, to copyright law, hate speech, harassment and malicious communication law, and of course, things like defamation law. Nonetheless, governments still do their best, or perhaps their worst, to impose their control further. The online harms white paper, which I shall be returning to a, a few times during this, this talk, is perhaps the most recent manifestation of a long-standing pattern. When the internet first started to take on a life of its own, a school of thought emerged known as cyber libertarianism. In 1996, John Perry Barlow's Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace essentially declared that earthly governments had no jurisdiction over cyberspace, that they had no right to regulate and no means to regulate the internet. Cyberspace, as it was labeled, was independent, borderless, and ungovernable. A diametrically opposed school, led most prominently by Larry Lessig, known as the cyber paternalists, said very much the opposite. Not just that governments had jurisdiction, but the duty to govern, and that effectively, the nature of cyberspace created by code made it especially governable. Governments could and should regulate cyberspace through the manipulation of the very code that makes cyberspace. Both sides had a point, and both sides still have a point. Neither, however, see the whole truth. Advocates of both perspectives can tend to buy into this damaging Wild West myth. The cyber libertarians liking the romance of it, the cyber paternalists disliking the lawlessness and dangers. Both have an interest in perpetuating the myth for those same, same reasons. But many things have changed since those heady early days. One is that the inhabitants of what was then referred to as cyberspace have changed. It's no longer just the province of tech savvy, mostly rich, mostly what male, mostly white Americans, but the province of everyone. People with very different views, very different needs, and very different understandings of the role of government. Another is that the uses to which the internet is put have expanded and extended into pretty much every realm of life. Connected with this, the links between the online world and the offline world, sometimes referred to as the real world, are much tighter and closer than they ever were. This means, amongst other things, that what happens online impacts upon the real world more, and that it's easier for the real world to impinge on cyberspace. Governments can, do, and sometimes should be able to find the real person behind the online action and enforce their laws upon them. For all these reasons, governments have got increasingly involved in attempting to regulate the internet. And all too often, they've got it very badly wrong. There are a number of connected reasons for these failures. They tend to focus on the symptoms of a problem rather than what lies behind them. They tend to, tend to look too narrowly at those symptoms and don't see either the bigger picture or what the unexpected consequences of any actions might be. They try to apply their old regulatory methods to the new situation, regulating often by poorly chosen analogy rather than understanding what is really happening and regulating accordingly. They listen to the wrong people. 
people with vested interests such as corporate lobbyists, or people with very focused views such as certain people within the security establishment. They look for magical solutions. And the way that technology often seems almost magical makes it easy for them to think in those kinds of terms. They underplay privacy, seeing it as selfish, individual, indulgent or outdated, rather than something that underpins the whole of our system of rights and our autonomy. And there's a tendency amongst some to want to control anything they don't understand. And the Internet is a prime example. The online harms white paper, which if it wasn't for first Brexit and now the coronavirus, would have been a key focus of government this year, is a prime example of almost all these tendencies. And I'll be talking more about it later. Though it is mostly very well intentioned, it has the potential to either be a farce or a disaster, depending on how the government ends up implementing it. What it does is attempt to address some of the key current issues of internet regulation. It covers a wide range of, internet, of online harms, including things that have been the focus of much of my research in the last few years. Fake news is one. The label is a bit misleading, but it does give a flavour of this, the problems associated with misinformation, disinformation and political manipulation. Trolling is another. And as we shall see, what constitutes trolling and who could be counted as a troll are big, subjective and hard to, hard to regulate questions. These and three other connected issues are what I'm going to talk about next. The others don't constitute harms in the way that the online harms white paper you know, uses, but they have the potential to do a great deal of harm to people who use the internet. These are surveillance, location data, and health data. I have whole sections about these. They're very interesting, deep and complex issues, but have come to, head, to a head in this particular coronavirus crisis. All are connected and all are critical issues for not just current, but future regulation. Let's start with fake news. It's not a new problem. Indeed, it's as old as news itself. Here's one of the early victims, Vlad Tsepes. Vlad the Impaler, Dracula, a byword for cruelty, barbarism and evil. On this slide, you'll see a woodcut of him calmly eating his dinner with his victims impaled in front of him. Did this ever happen? Is this a contemporary account? No, it was created by people who wanted to blacken the memory of a man who was, and still is to a great extent, a hero to the ethnic Romanians at the time. A fearsome warrior and brave fighter against the Turks, at least that's how his supporters would have described him. The woodcut pamphlets were produced by the ethnic German merchants of Transylvania who wanted to control the territory. Vlad had made lots of enemies, not just the ethnic German merchants. Orthodox monks in Russia who didn't like his conversion to Catholicism, Hungarian courtiers supporting their king who wanted to resist Vlad's attempts to get them to help, help him fight the Turks, and the Turks himself who didn't like being resisted and indeed defeated on a number of occasions. All contributed to create a myth based on some reality, but exaggerating and manipulating. And they, the, the most important thing to understand is that they used the best communication methods of the time. This is the Tooley Street Fire in 1861 in London, a big and dramatic event. One of the best reports of it was written in German newspapers by the famous novelist and poet Theodor Fontaine, who included first-hand accounts of witnesses and graphic descriptions of what he'd seen. The trouble was, Fontaine never went to London. He made the whole thing up. It was cheaper for newspapers to make them up than have foreign correspondents and then using the newly developed and still expensive telegraph. This was so popular that a whole genre of fake foreign correspondence grew up in Germany in the 19th century. This pattern repeats itself throughout history. Fake manipulative news spread by the best communication methods of the time. For Vlad, woodcut pamphlets. In Tudor England, plays. In 17th century France, songs sung in the streets by Cole Porter. 19th century Germany, newspapers. In the 20th century, radio, from Lord Haw Haw to Hanoi Hannah, and then television, including such memorable things as Comical Alley in Iraq. Or, and of course, the press, the tabloid press in particular, and the likes of Fox News. In the 21st century, in our internet era, 
That means Facebook and other social media. This is what makes fake news different now from its regular recurrence throughout history. Facebook and its equivalents allow fake news to be created in minutes in forms that seem to be almost indistinguishable from real news. It can be cr carefully crafted to target audiences, preferences and prejudices, all of which can be determined through profiling, which is how Facebook works, and then delivered to them instantly and at almost no cost and almost no risk. Comparing that to the costs, time, energy and risks involved in making fake news in the past, whether it be creating woodcut pamphlets in the 15th century or creating radio broadcasts in the 20th. And you see how different it is now. It's easier, it's faster, it's cheaper, and it can be precisely targeted. The analysis of people's interests and prejudices is what allows the fake news to be both designed and targeted and to be effective. And there's empirical evidence, some of it funded by Facebook itself, um, to show that it works. Facebook has been able to show that it can improve voter registration, increase actual voting, voting turnout, and manipulate people's emotions, making them measurably happier or sadder. And it can do that in a selective, targeted way. It can aim for particular demographics. It can aim for particular regions. It can even aim for particular races, though it's officially not supposed to do racial profiling Instead, it uses a system it calls racial affinity groups. Not what race you are, but what race you have affinity with, making it a question of taste rather than ethnicity. It doesn't really matter. It still has the same effect. And this is what Cambridge Analytica effectively tapped into, using Facebook not in a rogue way, but following the normal patterns that Facebook uses, just in a political sphere rather than a commercial one selling politicians and political views rather than selling shirts or movies. All of this, it should be noted, is based on the way that Facebook and others invade privacy. It's the profile and targeting and the personalization and tailoring that allows the fake news to have its effect. Indeed, you can argue that what's happened with, with Cambridge Analytica is an inevitable conclusion, an inevitable result of the way that Facebook is designed and Facebook works. There are many parallels between these problems and the problems we have with so-called trolls. And uh, just as misinformation has always exist, so existed, so has bullying, abuse and harassment. The difference now, as with the misinformation, is that the capabilities of the internet and social media in particular provide, that are provided for those who wish to bully, abuse and harass. Just as misinformation and manipulation is essentially taking normal media and political practices a bit further, so trolling takes normal human behavior a bit further. When does a bit of banter become harassment? When does a robust exchange of views become abuse? These are old, old questions that are very hard to answer on anything but a case by case basis. And what the Internet does is make the number of cases so huge, so fast and so hard to follow that dealing with them at a legal level is naturally very hard. There are no magical solutions, nor easy ways to identify in any particular interaction who is the troll and who is the victim. Indeed, one of the most common practices is for trolls to report their victims as trolls or go them into doing what the troll knows is against the terms and conditions of their site in order to get them blocked or banned from a social platform. Any tool you design to catch trolls all too often becomes a tool used by trolls on their victims. Perhaps the biggest example of this is the clamour to end anonymity, to force people to use their real names on the Internet. There are three arguments regularly used in support of this. First, the idea that people wouldn't be so bold if they, if they had to operate with their real names. Second, that they would be shamed by it as their friends and their parents would know that they were being trolls. Thirdly, that they would be easier to hunt down and prosecute. Only the third of these really has any evidence behind it. The empirical work is at best unclear on the first two, and in one of the biggest studies actually showed the exact reverse, that trolls were found to be more aggressive 
and more abusive when they were forced to use their real whether this was because their their shame was gone or because it was some kind of badge of honor or some other reason is unclear even this third point too is unclear is weak because we can already almost always lift the veil of, of anonymity if we need to plenty of supposedly anonymous trolls have been identified located and prosecuted but anonymity has not protected them the really bad thing about the clamor for anonymity however is that it can and does harm exactly those people it's intended to protect it can help bullies and trolls find their victims more easily it can allow them to find better ways to hurt them there are many people for whom anonymity or at least pseudonymity is crucial from abused spouses to victims of crime and whistleblowers and people under oppressive governments it can make all the difference for them legally requiring real names will make their lives impossible or even worse some anonymous bloggers in mexico have been unmasked hunted down and killed by the drugs cartels we don't know what happened to many people in similar situations elsewhere again the key here is privacy we need privacy as a protector for the victims not as a shield for their for the villains surveillance has been one of the biggest issues on the internet for a long time. The nature of the internet in some ways makes it very easy to gather data on those who use it, what they do and how they do it, when they do it, and so on. And the nature of that data makes it easy to analyze, aggregate, and more. When you combine that with the instincts of both governments and businesses to want to know more about their citizens and, and customers, you can see why it's so tempting to make surveillance a big thing. When you add to that the regular downplaying of privacy, particularly in relation to security, you have a recipe for excessive and often ineffective surveillance. Those who understand privacy know how much privacy can support rather than damage security, something that politicians and the security services really should understand given how much they value their own privacy. Hence, while moving towards an internet of effectively unfettered surveillance, won't really help security at all, very much the opposite. If governments seem keen to do, encryption is undermined. It won't do that much to help the fight with terrorists and pedophiles. They have their own ways around most of this, but it will weaken the security and privacy of um, everyone else. It will give criminals better opportunities to find and harm the victims and so forth. The surveillance has been uh, contemplated and indeed done in the, cor the coronavirus crisis fits this pattern very much. People see the upside. They hope it can help us reduce the spread of the virus and save lives, and indeed help us get out of the, the current lockdown, but rarely see the risks associated with it. And if anyone even dares to mention privacy issues, they tend to be shouted down or ignored. They also tend to, it's been true about surveillance in relation to terrorism as well, overestimate the effectiveness of these potential forms of surveillance. In relation to the coronavirus crisis, for example, um, contact tracing is of little use at all if you don't have extensive, accurate, and properly controlled testing regimes. It won't do anything other than that because the information that you bring in will cause more harm than good. If somebody is deemed to be a, uh, a risk, they will be locked down. If that's incorrect, that's a bad, bad news for them. If they're seen to be, a, uh, to be clear but are actually in just, then they can spread it with more impunity and people will be unaware of the spreading. Given that with this coronavirus, so much of the infection is asymptomatic, this is a fundamental flaw and we shouldn't be looking to this as a great solution. But one of the ideas, uh, one of the reasons that for the coronavirus is so attractive is that it taps into two of the most important areas in internet data in the current era location data and health data location data is gathered almost constantly we mostly have our phones with us all the time and even when we turn location services off on our phones they're still connecting via phone masks and or wi-fi 
which gives our location to some degree. It gives enormous amounts of data, not just where you are and when, but often what you're doing, who you're doing it with, which is where the coronavirus bit comes, comes into, into play, and also where you're not. Which if you're not at home when you should be, or you're not at, at work when you say you are, then your location data can reveal that. It's immensely valuable, whether for commercial purposes, such as localized advertising, or for an analysis of patterns in aggregate, what are normal behavior patterns and so forth. Um, but it can also make people very vulnerable, and not just for those who have enemies and, and who want to hunt them down. If your own behavior can be analyzed by location, you can be profiled more accurately and that profile used against you. As we'll see with health data, this can be a very big deal. If you go to the wrong places at the wrong time in relation to risk, you may, might be punished with higher insurance, refusal of credit, even lost jobs. More directly, if you're revealed not to be at home, your home might be more vulnerable to burglars. The test with all of this is how we can get the benefits of this kind of data without associated risks growing too high. And ways to do that can only be found if we're willing to acknowledge these risks and address them. That's hard at the best of times. Nobody wants to see the bad downside. But uh, in times of crisis, as we have now, it's particularly bad. This is even more direct in relation to health data, perhaps the biggest and most important area at the moment. Health data is gathered in immense numbers of ways, directly from your um, doctors, your health records, indirectly from the kinds of things you search for, from your wearable tech, Fitbits, Apple Watches, and so forth, from the times that you're active online and what you do in those things. Ordering a pizza at 2 a.m. might be seen as an indi indicator of certain um, not necessarily healthy habits. And it's important to remember that none of this is done on the aggregate and in such big scales that they don't have to work out what, what a reason that something might be associated with bad health. They just do the data analysis that shows that it is an indicator that there's a correlation rather than causation. And as a result, the risk of prejudice from all of this, bad decisions, unfairness, discrimination, and so on in relation to insurance, credit, jobs, and much, much more, are extremely great. As for location data, the question of how to get the benefits while minimizing the harms is a very big one. And even more with location, the risks, the downsides barely get a mention, and they need to. It's critical to see what happens when this current crisis is over. We are going to be introducing new measures. Will they stay once the emergency is over, or will they become part of an increasingly dangerous um, environment for privacy? And all of this together combines to produce a new era an era where privacy is more under threat than it's ever been before. I even sometimes talk about less than zero privacy. Zero privacy is where other people can find out everything that you know about yourself. Less than zero is where they can actually find out more about you than you know yourself. And that's where we're, we're headed. We may even be there already. And I haven't even mentioned the problems associated with the so-called Internet of Things, another big issue can of worms we really, really don't want to open. As well as being under threat more, it's also more important that we protect our privacy. And it's the single most important thing that we need to protect in relation to regulation. Protecting privacy will have a bigger effect on dealing with issues like fake news than any number of fact checkers and reporting systems or blocking particular providers will do. Protecting privacy will be will do far more than any number of report abuse buttons and so on um, to deal with trolls and trolling. If we can protect the targeting, protect the targets, we have more chance to protect the people concerned. The regular calls to end anonymity and to, to block end-to-end -end encryption show that we actually regulate, we tend to regulate in exactly the wrong way, undermining privacy when we should be supporting it. 
So why is it that governments always get things wrong? If we look again at the analysis I started with, you can see what's happened. Fake news, for example, is regulated only by looking at the actual fake news rather than how it impacts upon people, regulating the content rather than the profiling, targeting and delivery systems that mean it has an effect. And when regulators see anonymous trolls causing trouble, they make the superficial analysis that it's the anonymity that lies behind the trolling and don't widen their view to see how forcing real names would damage the victims more than it damages the perpetrators. And they're always looking for magical solutions. We see that with the coronavirus more than ever. They're always underplaying privacy and falling for their own authoritarian instincts. The online harms white paper is a case in point in all these ways. It looks primarily at the surface of the problems and seeks a magical solution in creating a duty of care on the social media providers and essentially expects them to find solutions magically because they're very clever. Now, they are very clever, but these are complex, nuanced problems that arise from society rather than from the social media platform. And the best ways to deal with them would drastically undermine the business models of exactly the people who are expected to impose this duty of care. Whatever methods Facebook chooses to enforce a duty of care, you can be sure that they won't fundamentally undermine their own business model. They won't be challenging the invasions of privacy, profiling and targeting things that are the key to their advertising revenue. They just won't. We shall see how they try to, how the governments try to square this particular circle, but I have to say I'm not optimistic. The signs and the chances of this being a success are really very poor. Cool. How it can be done better is a much bigger question. The starting point is that we need to change our whole perspective. We need to be willing to challenge the big assumptions and we need to be willing to challenge the big business models, the internet giants. We need to be brave enough to take on these giants. Breaking up Facebook, for example, may well be the single best thing we can do to deal with fake news, misinformation and, and political manipulation. Do we dare do it? It seems unlikely. Most of all, however, we need to keep our eye on the ball. We keep, need to keep watching things and we need to be willing to act when we can. The solutions that we find will tend to be messy ones, combining various different techniques. So to deal with trolls, yes, you need report abuse buttons, but you'd also need to protect people's privacy and you need to protect people's um, ability to use um, pseudonyms and so on. We need to combine legal, technical and practical so, um, solutions to produce something that works and to know that it's not going to be a real complete solution but it's going to be something that alleviates a problem and that will have consequences uh, consequences in other ways and we need to keep watching them it's messy and that i think is where i will end it because it is all a little bit of a mess but it's a functional mess and our regulation has to remember that the internet is something that we all use we all will continue to use and for the most part we use effectively we need to be careful to maintain that and not to lose sight of the bigger picture thank you very much i'm now ready for questions okay yeah we're now having the opportunity for you to ask paul any questions you may have so to ask a question you've got to click on the purple tab on the bottom right of your screen and type your question into the chat and then I'll sort of screen the, uh, the, the, the chat. Uh, the first question here, is Paul going to get paid double? No, he's not. Well, actually he is. He gets paid zero and two times zero is still zero. Um, <laughs> so that's our first question there. We will, um, we will wrap up in plenty of time so we can all do our clap for carers at, at eight o'clock. But we do have some time now to ask some questions. And as long as the technology will allow us and Paul will be patient with us, we'll, we'll take some uh, questions. So I'm going to start off with one from Alex here, Paul. Um, what are your thoughts on how GDPR has worked as a regulation? Uh, how does that connect with the storyline you've been telling us about today? Um, can you hear me now? Good. Um, 
the GDPR is a very interesting case. I mean, it's the biggest piece of, of regulation we've had um, in the field for a very long time. And in some ways, it's it's had a good effect, I think. Um, I, just to give some background for people who don't know, this is the the, the new the new version of the of the data protection regulation. Data protection is the prime way that we protect privacy from a regulatory um, perspective on on in all digital areas and in particular on, on the internet. One thing that GD, the GDPR did was it reminded everybody about stuff that was already there. The, a lot of the data, the things that we think are new with the GDPR actually were already there, just weren't enforced. Um, and weren't, they weren't able to punish people enough. They weren't able to, to fine um, beyond a certain limit that was effectively peanuts to the big internet companies. So the internet companies, could to a great extent ignore what um, what was in data protection law. They can't do that so much anymore because the finding capabilities of the new law are much, much bigger. Um, however, it's still not clear the extent to which it really works because some of these areas are so complex and because even the GDPR focuses on certain things um, on too superficial a level. For example, in, in relation to um, data breaches, they focus on the breach itself, not on the system that was set up that allowed the breach to happen. You can be fined a lot for a bad data breach. You can't be fined at this stage, or at least you haven't been fined at this stage, for having a system that might allow such a big data breach. And we need to change that, I think. And it's, diffi it's difficult to see our authorities doing that in any way, but it could be a starting point. I would say that the other thing that GD, the GDPR has done that's good is kind of set a standard that the rest of the world is trying to follow. We didn't have any data protection in um, the US in any real sense before. Now we don't, we still don't, except within California, but even Mark Zuckerberg is talking about it as a good regulatory model. Uh, it's, I wouldn't be too hopeful about the GDPR doing too much, but it is at least a starting point. Great, that's very helpful. We've got a couple of questions that are in the kind of data harvesting um, world. Um, one quite, one person's asking, you know, who's doing it? You, you mentioned it. it could affect our insurance and our job offers. Uh, and I'm going to guess your answer and then ask you to probe a bit more around, around Facebook and what would breaking up Facebook actually mean? Um, and just a bit more sort of fleshing out, you know, could there be, if, if Facebook were, were broken up, based on the business model they have around targeted ads etc do, do we even have an internet without targeted ads so there's a whole cluster of questions here on the interrelationship i think between the data harvesting the targeted ads and how to break that uh, that connection okay so there are there are numbers of different connected things and, and i can see i can read some of the questions on the side and i can see how some of the things are, are, are coming forward it's a regular argument by the um, industry that if you kill advertising you kill the internet everything is going to die we've got to be able to invade privacy as much as we possibly can um, in um, if the internet is going to going to survive now I don't think that's true that's one one point I think there are ways that we could build business models that don't operate in that way we haven't really done so um, so far because the business models of Facebook and to a certain extent, Google does does very much the same. Um, because they've worked so well, it's been hard for any other uh, mechanism, any other model to, to, to get a chance to develop. And I think the, the consequences of the current model are so dire that we have to try it and see, see what happens. We have seen, particularly during this particular crisis now, how much we depend on the internet, how much we need the internet um, in many different situations, but particularly in times of crisis. So we have to make sure that we have a way to do so. Um, we have also seen how how there are numbers of extra um, possible ways that we can um, we can operate things on on the internet. I should say. I'm not saying when I talk about breaking up Facebook that we should stop advertising on the internet. 
there, sh there should there are ways of advertising that are better than other ways for example what we call contextual advertising so if you go to a page that's about holidays in australia they show you ads for holidays in australia that's different from behavioral advertising which profiles you rather than the page you're visiting and puts ads based on who you are now there's some dispute about how effective behavioral rather than rather than contextual advertising might be but either way if we are willing to try the different models we have better ways to do it now the, the other thing that this this particular crisis has shown is I, I'm sure some of you will have seen that the newspapers are concerned about um, their own business model and they've been campaigns to go out and buy a business model. One of our biggest problems has been that the news industry has largely built itself into a corner, um, effectively jumping into bed with the likes of Facebook and so on, and then suddenly now they find they're dependent on them and, and, and everything is in trouble. We have to find a way to do that better too. And I don't have a magic wand, an answer to how to do that, but I think people are, are kind of working on it. Some degree is to do with our attitudes. You know, we have to, to, to find a way to change our position and not expect to get everything for nothing. If we are more willing to, to go along with other business models, we have more chance of finding a way to succeed. So for example, paying for journalism. So having a subscription to the, to the, the sources that you, you approve of, being willing to pay rather than expecting it for, for nothing is part of the, uh, the solution. But I, I, I have to say, there isn't an easy answer to any of this. What we do know is how bad the current situation is and we have to start finding ways to get it to work. Thank you, Paul. It's Rachel here. We've actually lost Francis temporarily, so I'll be um, putting the next question to you. Okay. Uh, we've had a couple of questions. The first one from uh, Philip Randall, who's asked if you have any view regarding children's use of the internet, um, as it's hard enough for us, and that current parental controls are not very effective. And then Mark Dunn has elaborated on that to ask more about the impact of regulation on other marginalized users as well, such as the disabled, elderly, right. poor, um, those with learning disabilities as well. Okay, I'm very happy to take those. They're both, they're both very interesting and closely related um, subjects. I think the, the, the question of children is a really big one. And I, and, and something I've been um, thinking about and working on for quite, quite a long time. There's a lot of good research going on about children and the internet. I think um, you need to differentiate different ages of children. I, and, and I think this is a, a thing that people often, often miss. Um, if you're talking about, for example, young teens, that's very different from talking about um, five and six year olds. One of the many things to say about this we have an overprotective attitude towards the older um, children. What do I mean by that? Well, actually, in many cases, they're better at dealing with the problems than the older people are. One of the interesting um, findings in research on fake news is that the people who believe fake news, who are easiest to target and to fool with fake news, tend to be older people, not kids. Kids are much better at seeing through it and much better at avoiding it. And the, the prime areas, I'm afraid to say, because I'm one of them myself, are the middle-aged men who are the most likely to believe in fake news than they are to, um, the, and, and most likely to be persuaded by it. Um, there are lots of reasons for that, and which the middle-aged men amongst us should be at least aware of. Um, so in, in, in that, those senses, children can be better than adults, and we need to be better at understanding that they understand more than than they um, than we think they do protecting them trying to create a safe environment can actually be a trap because it means that they're not able to do, to find the defenses that they need for themselves they need to be um, armed with the tools to defend themselves rather than protected by um, those of us who are less able to um, to actually understand the problems that they're that they're encountering Having said all of that, with younger children, very much is a problem, and we need to work hard on, on finding ways to make things safer. And I should say there's lots of very good work going on about that. And for most people, most of the time, 
and this counts for kids too, the internet is a relatively safe and very productive environment. Those of you who have school-aged children um, at the moment, and I'm one of those, who are seeing how they work, work online for their schools, will, will generally find that they do it well and they understand it much better than we might expect. I think that's something that we need to, to kind of work on. Um, in relation to the other marginalized groups, there are lots and lots of different issues here that need to be taken into account. Where we have things that are um, commercially based, marginalized groups often suffer. So if you profile people in order to um, effectively um, make money out of them, that often ends up targeting the mainstream, the biggest markets that you that you can find, the places where you're most likely to be able to, to make money, which ends up marginalizing um, the group who actually often have the greatest need for the sorts of things that the technology can provide. I know some disabled people who've said to me, now everyone's experiencing what we have to experience when we find it much harder to get out and we're, we're often stuck at home. They're, they're all suddenly shocked by the impact. This is what we have to suffer most of our lives. And um, I think we need to understand that sometimes for certain marginalized groups, the internet should be a, a, an opportunity to, to, to provide liberation and support, and it often ends up being the opposite. What I would like to say is governments could and should spend more time supporting those groups. Now, that's true in every field, but it's true in internet access in particular. The privacy protections that I've talked about work even work particularly for those groups as well because if you are profiled as as somebody of in, in a vulnerable group you can be targeted now people will i'm sure be aware of older relatives being targeted by scammers and um i know people who've been targeted by people be calling them up um, out of the blue trying to say we've heard that you're you're you've got a problem with this you must log on and do this and they believe them, go on and do it, and end up effectively giving away their bank account details and things like that. It's a very, very big um, issue. And I would say almost everybody is working on it. We solve it by collaborative, collaborative work. What I described, the, I didn't go into it in great detail, as messy solutions. Messy solutions means working things out um, in a flexible way, using lots of, of the different tools that are available, because there is no simple solution to any of this on its own. You really have to combine all these things, these things together. There is a responsibility, a as put in the online white paper, a, a duty of care, but the duty of care should be um, focused in ways that actually support the the, the vulnerable groups in particular. Um, there should be a duty of, for example, accessibility as well. Online accessibility is a key. As we've seen with this lecture, it's not so easy to get things to work in a mainstream technological way, let alone a way that works for all, um, all people with, diff with various relevant difficulties. Um, I don't know if that really helps. I, I, can, <laughs> I can go on about this a great deal. <laughs> That's great. That, that's really useful, Paul. Um, so I, I was uh, off there for a few moments, but I'm back again now. And I, I was really struck by Thomas Chakrabarti's uh, question. And Thomas made a comment during your talk, actually. And just before you made the point about how anonymity is actually useful when uh, for activists um, in oppressive regimes, just before you made that point, Thomas put that on the chat, I believe. So he was, he was definitely with you there in terms of following the flow of your lecture. Um, and he's asked, his concern is about protecting activists in oppressive societies. So what's your view on backdoors to social media data for, for governments? OK, um, my, my basic view is that they're a very bad idea, that providing backdoors um, is in general a bad idea. Um, and we have to understand that from a technological standpoint, if you create a backdoor for anybody, you create you create a backdoor that can be used by other people. So create it for your your um, supposed good guys, and you effectively allow the bad guys to use the the, the backdoor. That even aside from identifying who the good guys and the bad guys are, in some if you say the good guys are the authorities, that's great. You trust your authorities, but but in many places, you can't trust your authorities. And in most places, you probably shouldn't 
trust your authorities in that in that kind of a way. And a backdoor is a is a kind of a it's a, it's a recipe for disaster. There are usually technical ways to to deal with the the, the biggest problems anyway. That is, um, if 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 you make something insecure, you are effectively only protecting the people who are um, bad at protecting themselves, and you can get them in any other way anyway. Um, Backdoors are a bad thing. Total lack of um, openness is also a bad thing. It is generally possible to find ways into the organization. Now, let me give you an example here. I mean, the, 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 the problems that we have on social media are one thing. The really, really bad stuff mostly doesn't happen on social media. By that, I mean things like the um, pedophile networks, child abuse imagery, and so on. A great deal of that happens on what we refer to occasionally as the dark web and the dark net and so on. And the only way to deal with that is through effectively infiltration. That is, that effectively a human finds a way in, breaks it down using human techniques, not using um, technical techniques. These things can always work in the end. Hard, very hard, and uh, can't, I can't and wouldn't want to go into some of the details of what they have to do to do it. But if you can, can um, use human ways into things, it's a much better general approach. Now, and there's an interesting parallel here with, with what they're talking about, the, the coronavirus tracking apps. Um, and I'm, I'm sure some of you will have heard some of them announced today. The essence, the key for these to work are going to be the human trackers, not just the technical trackers. It's always a kind of hybrid solution rather than a technical solution to solve these, these, kinds, of, these kinds of problems. Um, if you do create things like backdoors and there are powerful um, forces allied, uh, arrayed against you, they will use them. So create a backdoor, you are in that moment creating something that will be abused and we have to find better ways to do our enforcement that do not allow those sorts of things to happen automatically great step okay thank you so how much do you think the problems lie with the law itself and how much of it is about the the practicalities of enforcement and how the law is actually imp implemented and enacted in practice so one of the, I mean, there are many issues here. I mean, I, I, I again, I, I point my way to, to point to, to messy solutions that have to combine things together. One of the biggest challenges with the internet is the sheer scale of it. And the sheer scale of it, I mean, for, if, for example, we look at uh, offensive comments on Facebook. If we had to prosecute each individual one, it would be an absolute nightmare. It would swamp the courts completely because there are so many of them. If we think that the solution to trolling, for example, is dealing with each of the individual trolls one by one, what do you do if you have a thousand people sending you a message within a minute? Can't do anything at all. So we have to find solutions that combine the, um, the legal, the technical, and together. All of them have to work together for the, for, to find any, any solution. A lot of it's to do with the enforcement, a lot of it's, which is inherently difficult, a lot of it's to do with the combination of the things, the things together. This is where there may be a clue in the online um, Harms White Paper's idea of a duty of care. That is, we have to build what the, um, uh, what the old cyber paternalists like Larry Lessig would have called architectural solutions. We have to build places that are uh, build structures that allow most things to be safe and so on and they are all working on it i mean i i, I would say if, for those people who like me spend a lot of time on twitter the ability to report abuse on twitter has improved substantially over the last two or three years the same is true in most places as and it's not because twitter used not to care but do now it's because the systems have been developing the priorities have been changing everything's been been developing and it's been a technical solution by the needs of the users rather than necessarily by the law. All of them have to work together. 
That's, that's really helpful. And um, there's an interesting question here, which you, you did touch on a bit in your, in your talk. It's about the kind of the pace of change. So how can governments ensure that they future-proof legislation when technology develops far faster than most legislation, legislation uh, processes? I'm also thinking, you know, one of my new words I've learned in the last few weeks is zoom bombing, which wasn't a word a while ago, and this is yet another yeah. thing to try and guard against. So how can we cope with that, the different spaces of government okay. processes, legal processes, and the technology processes? So this is one of the the, 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 the perennial challenges in, in technology, that law tends to move very, very slowly, technology tends to move very, very fast. And there are kind of two different legal approaches. You can either go for what we call the technologically neutral approach. That is, we, we design the law about uh, based on what people do rather than how they do it. So um, the, abuse, the, the law is against abuse rather than against specific messages in, done in a particular way to, to particular, particular people. Now, the alternative to a technologically neutral thing is technologically specific. If you do something technologically specific, it's very precise. The, the offences are very clearly defined and they're very easy to prosecute. If you do it technologically, but, but, but when the technology changes, you find you can't enforce it because rather than people using a an email and your law says something on, on an email they're using a using snapchat or or something like that the alternative of technologically neutral things they're harder to prosecute because it's harder to pin things down um, our, our various acts, things like the Malicious Communications Act takes, talk about messages sent through a public electronic communication system and, and so on. But what does that really mean? And does it, is an emoji um, an offensive message? And if you are a skillful troll in particular, you find ways to be offensive that can be described as non-offensive. So it's very hard. So how do we do it, deal with it? Well, again, I'm going to point towards messy solutions. We have to have the laws there. They have to be interpreted flexibly. And we have to find ways to make sure that only the really, um, that not everything has to go to court, you know? But, and this is where, again, the online health white paper is, in, is, is right in one way. A lot of the solutions are, are non-legal. Now, some of it, um, the old cyber libertarians would talk about community enforcement. That is, if you do something really bad, everyone else will shun you, so you'll be you won't be part of it, and you won't be able to communicate communicate anymore. Um, that's not that was really possible when there were groups of people who cared about what each other thought. It's not really possible in a place where everybody is um, is involved. Um, but there's something to it as well. That is, the community can do its own enforcement. What we, what again, the the um, the, the people in Lessig would say, talk about norms, social norms, norms of behaviour can actually t regulate people much better than laws. Um, again, I, I've probably gone, I've gone off topic a little bit. How do we deal with this? Well, we have to, and I, I'm very interested to see the last bits of Parliament we had um, yesterday doing partly online. We have to modernise our legal systems, modernise our lawmaking and make it more efficient and, and, and faster and more responsive. Um, big, but we have to do that in a democratic way. There is our really big challenge because one of the easiest ways to deal with it is to become more, more authoritarian allow regulators to make decisions without them going through Parliament. For example, as we see with emergency powers, it's very attractive if you want to be able to do things quickly. It's also fundamentally damaging to democracy. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, the last question that we've, we've on the there is a, um, a point about, well, you know, is it true that people who have nothing to fear have nothing to hide? And so having unfettered power to be able to access and manipulate uh, these communications should be fine if you've got nothing to, you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing, yeah. nothing to so, fear. Um, yeah, so, so just, I, go ahead, sorry, sorry, Paul, go ahead. The, the nothing to hide, nothing to fear um, argument is the oldest argument in, in privacy and is is deeply flawed in all <laughs> kinds of ways. Um, yeah. I mean, if, if I go back to Cardinal Richelieu, um, this is probably an apocryphal quote, quote, but it's pretty close. Give me six lines in the hand of the most honest man and I'll find something to hang him with. Mm. Um, 
context matters and um, things can be can be misused and things can be manipulated and uh, there are reasons that we take privacy seriously seriously as a right and why infringing it damages almost everything let me give you another example here a government has unfettered power that's fine if you trust the government but what about a bad government why do they why do people think the stasi operated the way it did in in east germany because the more it knew the more it could find ways to stop people from um, opposing it and one of the results of unfettered surveillance and this is surveillance is that it encourages conformity mm. and people end up um, not being free not because they're being locked up but because they're so afraid to do anything that's other than what's expected of them that they just don't do it mm. and you end up being a prisoner of yourself now those of us who are locked locked in have some sense of, of uh, the tiniest part of what that feels like if you have unfettered access to communications then you get that on a massive scale it is not a coincidence that the most autocratic and dictatorial of regimes have been the most supportive of surveillance the two go together yeah, absolutely. And it again seems in the chat that you and Thomas are on the same wavelength because before you said it, he said the nothing to hide argument depends on a government you trust. So I don't yeah. know if you know um, each other, but you two should definitely have a chat at some point. Yeah. Um, can I, can I add, add one thing, one thing to that? I mean, this is one thing, a thing that's really important to understand. But when we create infrastructures, so I mean the, the technology that allows surveillance, and when we create laws that allow surveillance, we're not just creating them for the government of the moment and for the time that we have of the moment. We're creating them for the government that might, might follow. So we may think we've got a good trust in government. What happens when we don't? So let me give you a prime example of that. Um, people get very upset about um, Cambridge Analytica and so on in relation to the, the, the way that Donald Trump's campaign used it to potentially manipulate the election. We don't know whether they did or did effectively turn it. We know they tried. People were very excited several years before when Obama did a, did a lot of data work because it sounded advanced and great. It sounded as though um, they were being modern and, and creative and so on because the people who were commenting liked Obama, the people who were commenting didn't like Trump. The, the, any system that we use, we need to think what would the bad guys do with this, not just what would the people that we like do with this. So if we like governments and we think we should trust them with everything, remember your this nice government will be replaced by a nasty government um, at the next election. Absolutely. So we, we've, you've been extremely patient with our questions and maybe after the uh, conversation, Paul, you'll enjoy looking back on the chat. I know you're, you're not looking at that as a way of kind of focusing on, on, the, on the conversation here, but you might enjoy some of the other points that have been made in, in the chat as, as you reflect back. We've really had people really engaging with, with your ideas. But just before you close out, I've got one last question for you, because I think uh, this is coming from earlier on in, in, the, in the, uh, the chat uh, earlier this evening. You know, we've got a lot of law students, we've got a lot of members of the legal profession, people who are curious about the legal profession who are watching watching this event this, tonight. Um, what is it that, that you'd like to see the legal profession do rather than governments do? What is it the lawyers the legal profession could do to promote better regulation of the internet and, and privacy? Uh, <laughs> you know, in general, I think the legal profession does remarkably well on this i mean i you know they, they they do their very best and some of some of the the most important developments have come through cases supported directly by the, the legal professions often on pro bono basis or, or and so on the legal profession needs needs to and does understand its role in all of this and as we've seen um over the last few years and 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 i was hoping not to mention Brexit, but I'm going to have to mention Brexit. The legal challenges have been some of the few things that have actually helped us to get get to, to move things. We have to be, the legal profession has to be um, able to continue to challenge the things that are done by governments. 
the legal profession's role in holding governments to account is absolutely critical. Absolutely. Well, thank you very, very much. Um, I think that's all the, 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 the questions we've got time for this evening, but I really, really appreciate your patience there uh, with some really quite tricky uh, questions, and I certainly learned a lot myself. Thank you all for engaging with us and asking these fabulous questions. Um, look out for our email with the link to our event. We'll also ask Paul to do a, a recording with, this, with the slides and whatnot. Um, obviously, there were a few glitches and we hope to learn, but it does seem as if many people have got a lot out of this today. So thank you all very, very much for attending. It's been a great evening and uh, thank you so much, Paul, for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very much, everybody.